our scripture this morning. We're going to kind of read it together. It's kind of short. Uh, it comes from Matthew, uh, Matthew 18, uh, verses 10 through 14. And it's entitled, The Parable of the Wandering Sheep. And let's all read it together. It'll be up on the screen. Be careful that you don't look down on the one of these little ones. I say to you that their angels in heaven are always looking into the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If someone had 100 sheep and one of them wandered off, wouldn't he leave the 99 on the hillside to go search for the one who had wandered off? And if he finds it, I assure you that he is happier about having that one sheep than about the 99 who didn't wander off. So ends the reading of our word, the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Well, have you ever been lost? I ask the kids this. Have you ever been lost? Randy, have you ever been lost? You know, still. Kids sometimes get lost, right? How many of you ever had that feeling where your kids kind of wandered off? You know, isn't it, isn't it as a parent, isn't that the most frightening thing? Is to not be able to lo- know where your kids are? I, my mom used to, we were like 17, 18 years old, and she used to pace the floor at night because she thought we were lost and stuck in some ditch somewhere. You know, I remember her just pacing the floor, you know, when my brother was, because it was always my brother <laughs> that was was lost. Um, but, you know, I just remember that, you know, some, some people put their kids on leashes. Have you ever been to the mall and seen, like, little kids with leashes on? I don't, I don't know about that, but, you know, some, yeah, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. I remember one time Rachel got lost in a grocery store. And me and Karen were shopping and everything. We looked down, Rachel's not there. You remember this? <laughs> she, was lo- she was lost a lot. But you know, then there became this announcement over the loudspeaker that Rachel was looking for her lost parents. You know, so we go to the customer service, you know, and there's Rachel. Smile, big grin on her face. And she was worried about us because we were lost. She thought we had wandered off and became lost. You know, my dad was always getting lost in the car. Always. You know, of course, we don't always like to admit that we're lost. And a lot of times my dad's response to us is, you know, we'd be in the back seat and say, Dad, are we lost? And he says, no, we've just never been this way before. You know, my mom used to get so mad at my dad telling him to pull into a gas station and ask for directions. And that's not kind of a guy thing to do is to go ask for directions. We like to figure things out on our own. But many have viewed this scripture as one that talks about the children. Maybe the youth of the church, our communities of our world. And yes, God is concerned for the children, the the little ones. You know, scripture tells us that Jesus says, let the children come to me. And we have that Bible song, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. But the lost sheep... That God, the shepherd, will leave the 99 to look for the one, the one who is lost. So if God is always looking for us and the ones that are lost, why should we be worried about it? Well, for good reason. We should be worried about it. You know, our scripture says that I say to you that their angels in heaven are always looking into the face of my father who is in heaven. Now, a little angel theology for you um, about the theology around angels. And there is actually theology around angels in the Bible. 
You know, we all think that, you know, our kids are such angels when they're good, right? And there's that movie at Christmas time, you know, It's a Wonderful Life, and, you know, um, uh, George Bailey is holding his daughter, and there's a bell on the tree that rings, and the little daughter says, you know, teacher says every time you hear a bell rings, an angel gets its wings, right? You know, we, we have this whole theology, or we, all, we say these things about angels, about, oh, you know, when someone passes away, that heaven's received another angel. You know, it's, it's kind of like we have this precious moments, or um, I had asked Karen, the willow, willow tree angels, you know, those figures that have no faces. I think they're kind of creepy and weird. But we have this theology about angels, you know. But um, some believe that even Jesus was an angel. You know, when we go to heaven, G Jesus is like on the throne there and he's like the head angel. You know, the Jehovah Witness say that Jesus is Michael, the archangel. But Jesus is God's son. Jesus is not an angel. Jesus basically, is God. And Jesus has a better name than being an angel. I mean, angels worship Jesus because Jesus is worth worshiping. And what sets us apart from most religions in the world is we, re we worship Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the one who deserves our worship. Jesus, as God, made the earth and the heavens Jesus has been exalted at the right hand of God. Jesus is glorious. You know, some people treat Jesus like their friend. And it's okay to do that. I remember growing up in Sunday school, we had the Sunday school song that it, it was kind of a strange Sunday school. But, and, but it, here's how the song goes. If I had a little white, I'd put my Jesus in. I'd take him out and kiss, 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 put him back again. If I had a little red box to put my devil in, I'd take him out and hit him in his head, put him right back again. That's what some people do to Jesus. They put him in a box, you know, or they put him up on the shelf. You know, I, I've done a message on, uh, you know, the elf on the shelf at Christmas. You know, a lot of times we put Jesus up on the shelf. And we only go to the shelf anytime we need Jesus. Anytime we're facing something. We need Jesus all the time. Je take Jesus off the shelf. But some people put Jesus in a box. A lot of people put Jesus in a box, just like genie in the bottle. You know, you, you rub the, the bottle and out pops Jesus to grant your every wish. But Jesus is God. And angels are servants of God. God made angels for God. I mean, some have put them into a hierarchy, you know, there's cherubs and seraphims, and they're at the top of this hierarchy of, of angels. And then there's angels and archangels at the bottom. Cherubs and seraphims are closest to God, and angels and archangels are closest to us. But angels were created by God to accomplish God's will. So why did God create angels? You know, John Piper who's a pastor, he's written several books and stuff. He says this, God created angels that his son might be glorified and his people might be satisfied. See, Jesus is God. Angels are servants of God. And Christians, are we angels? No, we are something better. We're adopted sons and daughters of God. And God sent his son for us. Our Easter story. You know, another thing about our scripture today, and if you've got a pew Bible or anything, what I want you to do is turn to Matthew 18, verses 10 through 14. And Mark, if you could put it back up on the screen. Go back, another slide. Okay. 
what I want somebody to do is to read out loud Matthew 18, verse 11. It's not there. It's not there. In most modern translations of the Bible, it omits verse 11. There are actually 16 verses in the New Testament that are lost, that aren't there in other places in the New Testament. If you look at the Gospel of Mark and get to chapter 16, it even has multiple endings. There's three endings to the, the, the Gospel of Mark. And there's a footnote behind, underneath. Right? There's also a footnote in the Gospel of John. You go to, you go to um, uh, chapter 7, verse 53, to all the way to uh, chapter 8, verse 10, I think. It's footnoted. Because sometimes that passage has not been found in the original text of the Bible. It was added later. Now a little bit about how the, the, the Bible was constructed. You know, some early verses were included as editorial content by the scribes that wrote the original manuscripts. It was an oral story, so people wrote it down. You know, they were maybe influenced by popular thought, what was happening around them at the time, even the spiritual conditions of the people in which they were among. You know, the Bible in its earliest form was just a long manuscript. Each book of the Bible was just this long manuscript. It, was, it didn't have chapters and verses. You know, most attribute the chapter parts didn't come until the 1400s. You know, a rabbi, Isaac Nathan ben Coliomus, uh, he took the Hebrew Bible and he tried to index it into chapters. The first person to divide the New Testament chapters into verses was an Italian Dominican biblical scholar, Santus Pagnino, uh, in about 1480. You know, it was Archbishop Stephen Langton and a Cardinal Hugo uh, developed a, a different scheme or a different systematic divisions of the Bible in the 13th century. And it was a system that um, Langton, his system, caught on. But the first English New Testament to use verse divisions was in, was in 1557. So that might seem like ancient history, but if you look at the birth of Christ being around, what, 6 AD, 9 AD, it's fairly recent. And the first Bible to do both chapter and verses in the Old Testament and the New Testament was the Geneva Bible. Published in 1560. So where are those missing verses? When they went to translate the modern translations, they went back to the original manuscripts, the oldest manuscripts, and if it wasn't there, they took it out. So are these verses lost? There's a big debate in the church. A lot of times you, you talk to a Baptist and they'll tell you, well, the only version of the Bible is the King James Version. And ironically, the King James Version use, gives us verse 11. And you know what it is? For the Son of Man is to come to save that which was lost. Seems pretty, you know, like... Why did they remove that? Well, a lot of times they can tell by the, the, the grammar or the, the handwriting that it was not done by the original person who did the original text. So that's kind of why there's a, a critical um, a deletion of it. So I ask you again, have you ever been lost? 
I mean, scripture's been lost. Sometimes we're lost in a book. You know, we open up a book, and we start reading a book, and we get lost in it, right? Maybe you become a character. You become, you know, you're on that sandy beach that's described. Or maybe you're, you're watching a movie, and all, all of a sudden you become part of that movie or a TV series or just lost. You know, I started binge-watching a TV show and, um, you know, and you know what binge-watching is, is you can stream things now so you can watch old programs that you missed the first time around. And I'm in the middle of season one out of six seasons of the TV series called Lost. How many people have watched Lost when it was first on? You know, it, it actually came out right after the movie Castaway with Tom Hanks, where his FedEx plane goes down and he's stranded on a desert island all by himself. And, you know, he kind of finds himself. He finds this volleyball and he paints a picture on it, Wilson, because it's a Wilson volleyball. It's kind of the same storyline as these passengers are on this plane crash, and it's a horrific plane crash, but at least 48 passengers alive and stranded on a remote island in the South Pacific. And their goal is simple survival. But they soon realized that it was far more than a mere chance that brought them together. And each of them had a purpose that will help them unlock the island's secrets. It's a series that has regularly been ranked by critics as one of the greatest television series of all time. When I saw that, I said, well, maybe I'll start watching it. It's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. So being lost. So what do we do when we get lost? You know, we used to have these. Right? We used to have atlases. And you know, every year you had to get a new atlas because why? New roads. You know, it play, it, you know, you use last year's atlas and you go into a major city and the turnoff's not there because it's a new road. It's a new highway or new bypass around the city, right? And stuff. And then they upgraded to um, GPS. You know, now you have GPS on your phone and your car. I love my GPS, my Android maps. You know, it tells me where my destination is, you know, um, and it will come up with the most efficient route avoiding obstacles, even tolls. I can even set a setting in there so it avoids all tolls. And you're looking for a restaurant, and, and it will not only tell you the route, but it will tell you your arrival time when you get there. And now you can even make reservations so you don't have to wait once you get there. You know, GPS does everything for us these days. You know, I just talk to it. I get in my car and I say, you know, I put it, I tell it the destinations and it pulls up a map and tells me the way to get there. You know, I'm having a conversation with my car. When I'm driving, it almost rules my life. It almost rules li my life. You know, when we look back at that scripture, Matthew 18, actually the little ones is not about the children. It's about us. It's about each one of us. Are, are those that are deep in their faith that have made themselves small in comparison to Christ. Because when you look at that comparison, we are quite small. Little in comparison to God. When you really think about it, God is big. God is huge. You know? A.W. Tozer says, what comes into uh, our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's your view of God. You know, think truthfully about God. I mean, God is bigger than you're able to understand. And if you had a God you can understand, that's not really a God worth worshiping, is it? And theology is a study of God. And when you study God, you begin to know how great God is, how good God is. And I'll tell you, you don't fully understand God. It's good 
that you haven't come to the end of your understanding of God. That's a good thing. There's a big, a big church up in Barrington, Illinois. It's the biggest church, it used to be the biggest church in uh, North America called Willow Creek. Willow Creek did a study several years ago called Reveal, a Reveal study. And the research, uh, the process was, it was a three-year process, a three-year process led by a world-class marketing firm. You know, they did 6,000 surveys were completed by Willow Creek attenders. And an in-depth analysis of 300 people who had left Willow Creek Church and an additional 5,000 surveys three years later, a follow-up survey. They did in-depth interviews with people regarding their spirituality and their current spiritual life. They studied the scriptures and, and more than 100 books and articles on spiritual formation. And the assumption, Willow Creek came in with an assumption before the research, Willow Creek had assumed that the more a person was far from God, participates in church activities, the more likely it is those activities will produce a person who loves God and loves others. That's kind of a good assumption, right? However, this assumption was found to be invalid by the research. To quote the study, does increased attendance in uh, ministry programs automatically equate to spiritual growth? To be brutally honest, it does not. See, the problem that the study found, the study divided church attenders into groups according to their level of spiritual formations. Those that were exploring Christians, those that maybe have come a very few times or hadn't been here very long, those that are growing in Christ, and those that are close to Christ, and those or those that are Christ-centered. And the study found that those that were in the first two categories, exploring and growing, the least mature attenders, actually did benefit more from church programs and ministries. However, those that were more mature, those that were close to Christ, christ sender, were often stalled. Stalled in their spiritual growth or dissatisfied with what the church was doing to help them grow. And when the stalled and dissatisfied group were combined, they totaled over 25% of their total membership. Those who admitted to being stalled seemed to come mainly from the close to Christ category. They appeared to be holding back or somehow blocked from spiritual growth and pro uh, progress. This group represents 16% of all those surveyed. Even though they see Jesus as the only way to salvation, only 7% reported, uh, reported regular Bible reading, and 25% of this group were considering leaving the church. I mean, I went to, when the study was revealed, they had like this big conference, and I went to the reveal study, and when I heard those figures, I go, Wow. Those who admitted to being dissatisfied seem to come from the most Christ-centered segment of the church. I mean, this group makes up 10% of our total church. But researchers made two important observations. This mature group of believers were dissatisfied with their church, did not keep them on track as they tried to lead a Christian life. And they were disappointed that the church had not helped them find other spiritual partners and mentors. Their overall conclusion, the church and its ministry seem to have the most influence at the very beginning of a person's spiritual growth. The hand-holding approach appears to be necessary in the early stages of spiritual growth. However, as an adolescent who longs for their independence, the more mature believers do, do not seem to benefit much from the programmatic hand-holding. The institution of church became less central to their faith development. It's kind of scary, isn't it? But it also gave some what-ifs. 
What if? Imagine a growing kingdom if a church figured out the ideal way to parent, to coach Christ followers all along their spiritual journey. Imagine the impact if all the stalled and dissatisfied people were put back on track and moved into a higher stage of spiritual maturity and productivity. Imagine what would happen if the church could create passageways that urge those who are growing and close to Christ to begin leading truly Christ-centered lives. Five years later, Willow Creek did a follow-up study entitled, Follow Me. And the researchers stated the Christ-centered people are the ball game. They are the important ones. They surveyed over 200 churches, and the headline is the same. The Christ-centered people offer the greatest high-impact opportunity for the church and the kingdom. The researchers admit that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to discipleship. However, the new goal of Willow Creek is to transition the role of the church from a spiritual parent to a spiritual coach. We need you as coaches, as mentors. As we grow into our spiritual growth, there is an increasing need for someone to hold us accountable, to speak truth to us. Yes, we can even become lost and discouraged in our faith. What if we became the maps? The maps, uh, an entry point of your mall, the mall. And what do they say? You go in there, you see the big map of the mall. And what do you do? You find you are here. What if we were that map for others? Here is the way to get to the store you want to go. I mean, I think that is partly what the reveal study told us is we sometimes look at for car parts in the clothing store. Now, I highly doubt that you're, you're going to find oil and spark plugs in a store that sells shoes. And before anybody says it, we have Walmart, right? But what if we go to pay less shoes to find our oil and our spark plugs? How likely are we to find them? We aren't. And we get discouraged and we leave. See, the, the purpose of a church, a community of other believers, is to show someone the GPS, the global positioning satellite, the God pointing system, the best acronym I could come up with, to help people connect their Sunday to Monday. And Monday to Tuesday, and Tuesday to Wednesday, until we get back to Sunday to again teach our people to go from Sunday to Monday, from Monday to Tuesday, to help the lost, to help the lost be found. To start with a, you are here, to help you name your point, a point of your current destination, and to walk beside them with them, encouraging them, teaching them, and even at times correcting them on their journey, their spiritual journey of faith. I mean, I look around at this church the year and a half that I've been here, and there's great examples here of us doing that. You know, we have Helen that's over here all the time planting flowers and you know, in the kitchen and everything else. We have Bev. We have several people doing, doing the work of the church. But you know the statement that I hear the most of from some people? Is I'm tired. We need people, more people to do this. So I ask who's going to do it? It's all our responsibilities. By being that map in the mall and saying, you're here. 
This is where you need to go. I've been part of a church where, uh, a church we planted, that very shortly into it, we basically set up our own dominions. You know, the person that made the coffee always made the coffee. You know, the person that always greeted people on the way in always did that. We built up walls around ourselves. We need to become a wallless church to pull somebody aside. You know, Dan takes the kids upstairs and rings the bell every once in a while. That's, that's good. You know, that's, that's why I always like working with kids is because they are, you know, people say they're our future. They're our now. We're our future because we'll be here tomorrow. We'll be here next week. So instead of being a church where we have a culture of not feed me, feed me, feed me, give me all the answers, fill me with all the knowledge of faith, that's practical faith. Wesley, John Wesley talks a lot about personal faith also. Faith of self-discovery. And that's not so systemized. One that can adapt to a person's learning style where they are currently on their faith journey. Where we are a church, we have a culture of helping ourselves and most importantly others where they are and where God wants them to go. Do you think we can be a church like that? I see examples of it. But can we be a better church of that? The scripture that we ends, and it's not lost, but the scripture passage ends and it concludes, my father who is in heaven doesn't want to lose one of these little ones. Amen. Oh Lord, as we have heard, we've responded Transform our thinking and our doing. May our actions speak your mercy and may our lives speak your generous love. We ask this all in his name. Amen.